Up. Graham Young is blind. You're moving it up and down. Up. Yet he can see. Down. Derek Steen feels pain in an arm that no longer exists. John Sharon sometimes believes he is God. My attitude was I was God, and then I had heaven and hell in my eyes. I was the, the grand guy who created heaven and hell. David Silvera is convinced his parents are imposters. It can look like my father. It can look identical to him, exactly like him, but it's not him. These people are not crazy. They have all suffered damage in tiny sections of their brains that has profoundly distorted the way they perceive themselves and the world around them. In the past, these bizarre cases would have been dismissed by science. But today, one neuroscientist tracks them down with the dogged persistence of a detective. What excites me is I can go in there and pretend I'm Sherlock Holmes and try and figure out what has gone wrong in this patient's brain, what's changed that accounts for the strange symptoms. And this, of course, is a lot of fun to do because you're learning a lot about the brain, learning a lot about what causes the symptoms in that particular patient. But more importantly, it's telling you about how the normal human brain works and how the activity of neurons in the normal brain gives rise to conscious experience and gives rise to the whole spectrum of abilities that we call human nature. Can the misfortune of brain injury shed light on the workings of the normal brain? Perhaps even help solve some of the eternal riddles of human nature? Understanding the human brain is one of the ultimate challenges in science. Watch my two fingers. Do you see my two fingers? Dr. Villanur Ramachandran is revolutionizing our understanding of how the brain works. His efforts to solve some of the most baffling neurological mysteries take him from the hospital bed to the outer limits of brain science. The human brain is without any doubt the most complexly organized form of matter in the universe. The brain is made up of 100 billion nerve cells or neurons. Someone has calculated that the number of possible permutations and combinations of brain activity exceeds the number of elementary particles in the universe. And this gives you some idea of the staggering complexity one is faced with in trying to understand the functions of this mysterious organ. So the question is, how do you even begin? Ramachandran began his investigations with a strange phenomenon called phantom limb syndrome. It's not uncommon for amputees to feel the vivid presence of a missing limb long after it has gone. One of Ramachandran's first patients was Derek Steen. Thirteen years ago, I was involved in a motorcycle accident and I pulled the nerves out of my spinal cord up in my neck. They told my parents directly that I would never use my arm again. About seven years ago, I was reading through the classifieds, and I saw an ad in there, uh, amputees wanted. I thought it was a joke. Like that. It's just basically connecting the club to the ball. So I called the number, and it was Dr. Ramachandran. Today, Derek is teaching Ramachandran how to play golf. But several years ago, Derek made a crucial contribution to Ramachandran's pioneering work in brain science. Yes, that was amazing. <laughs> After my surgery, I sat up in the bed and still felt the arm there, still felt everything there. And I'm looking down and I'm seeing nothing. <laughs> it was pretty bizarre. The more I thought about it, the more it hurt. The more it hurt, the more I thought about it. So it was, it was like, it was never ending. 
I mean, I'd break out in a cold sweat and turn pale just standing here talking to you because the pain would hit so bad. If there is any one thing about our existence that we take for granted, it's the fact that we have a body. Each of us has a body and, you know, you give it a name, it has a bank account and so on and so forth. Uh, but it turns out even your body is something that you construct in your mind and this is what we call your body image. Now, of course, in my case, it's substantiated by the fact that I, there really is a body with bone and tissue. But the sense I have, the internal sense I have of, of the presence of a body and arms and all of that is, of course, constructed in my brain and it's in my mind. And the most striking evidence for this comes from these patients who have had an amputation and continue to feel the presence of the missing hand. It was the beginning of an important relationship. Important for Derek, because not only would he finally understand his phantom pain, he would also get to the bottom of a mysterious sensation he felt while shaving. When I first started shaving after my surgery, I would feel my absent hand start to hurt and tingle whenever I shaved this left side of my face. Meeting Derek was important for Ramachandran because the explanation he came up with would rock the world of neuroscience. How about that? That's just my arm. The first thing Ramachandran did was to invite Derek to his lab for a simple test. Derek, I want to touch different parts of your body and I just want you to tell me what you feel and where you experience the sensation, okay? Okay. Close your eyes. You could feel that on my forehead. Anything anywhere else? No. Okay. It's on my nose. Okay. My chest. Your chest, okay. I can feel that on my cheek and I can feel rubbing on the phantom left hand. On the phantom left hand, mm -hmm. in addition to your cheek. I'm gonna run the Q-tip across your jaw and see what happens. I can feel a Q-tip on my cheek and I can feel a stroking sensation across the phantom hand. You actually feel it stroking across your phantom hand, mm -hmm. across the palm. So here is a medical mystery of sorts. Why does this happen? Why would a person, when you touch his face, claim that it's also touching his missing phantom fingers? That's fine. Palm. Phantom palm. This was just the kind of mystery that Ramachandran was drawn to although it would take some time to solve. One day, while Derek was making one-armed repairs on his favorite Chevy, Ramachandran turned up with his solution. It was a groundbreaking theory. The reason we think it happens is that in the brain, there is a complete map of the surface of the body. The entire left side of my body, the skin surface, is mapped on to the right side of my brain along a vertical strip of cortex which we call the somatosensory cortex. Similarly, the right side of my body is represented on the left side of my brain. So every point on your body surface has a corresponding point on this body map. Now it turns out that the representation of the face on this map is right next to the representation of the hand. Now that's a bit surprising, as you'd expect the map to be continuous and faithfully represent the left side of my body. But it doesn't. Now imagine what would happen if the left arm were amputated. The part of the brain corresponding to the hand no longer gets any input. And it's hungry for new sensory input, so to speak. The sensory signals from the face normally activate only the face area that's right next to the hand area. But they now invade the vacated territory corresponding to the missing hand and start activating the hand region in the brain. And so whatever is reading those signals higher up misinterprets those signals. It says those signals are coming from the missing hand. So you experience the sensations that's coming from the missing fingers even though I'm touching your face. And this is showing there's been a massive reorganization of the sensory pathways in your brain after the amputation. And it's as though there's been a cross-wiring in your brain. Which